Hello, hi, good evening and greetings everyone. This is Dilip and I'm welcoming you to the video of the month series. You know why I changed the name to the video of the month? It's quite simple. I couldn't make frequent videos. That's why I renamed this video series to the video of the month. The jokes apart and I do make videos on request and this month I received a lot of requests on a particular topic and that topic is going to be the video of the month and the topic is none other than the renal tubular acidosis. And let us discuss about the renal tubular acidosis, the basics and the actual differences between various RTAs which are a common exam point of view as well as in real life which are very important and so let us start with the RTAs, with the types of the RTAs in fact. What are the types of renal tubular acidosis? Number one, it is classically and commonly divided into type 1 or the distal RTA, type 2 or the proximal RTA and the type 4 or the hyperkalemic RTA. So, so by God's grace, there is no idea about why there is no type 3 RTA, but still certain books do explain that type 3 RTAs is a mixed type 1 and type 2 RTAs, especially commonly caused by drugs like acesolamide, but still the standard textbooks do not use the term called type 3 RTA. So let us keep the discussion simple with type 1, type 2 and type 4 RTAs. As you all know, these type 1 and type 2 RTAs are also called as hypokalemic RTAs and the type 4 RTAs are also called as hyperkalemic RTA. Uh, so there are like you know a lot of common features and a lot of differences between these RTAs but still uh, first of all to understand what is an RTA you need to know the basic functionality of the nephron so let me tell you first of all and see look the entire function of the kidney and the nephron is not the scope of the video and I'm going to tell like only things that are important for understanding what is renal tubular acidosis so let us take a nephron first let us put a different color probably like uh, green will be okay yes so so let me take this is the Bowman's capsule and let me go with the proximal converted tubule yes this is going to be PCT on the proximal converted tubule let me go to the loop of Henle. This is the thin ascending limb of the loop of Henle, followed by the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. <coughs> and the next structure is going to be the DCT or the distal converted tubule. And the final structure, like being the collecting ducts. Okay, fine. So now, what are basically the functions of the various parts of the nephron? First, let us go because our discussion will be with the proximal and the distal part of the nephron. I'm going to uh, keep this discussion between this proximal and the distal part of the nephron. So basically, what are the functions of the proximal part of the nephron? Is or the PCT proximal converted tubule? Number one, there are first of all understand there are a lot of tubular cells which contain brush border in the PCT, and I'm going to take one cell and blow it up. So yes, this is the PCT cell and this is the tubular lumen. Yes, number one function of the PCT because the PCT contains, you know, like uh, the brush border cells which contain the carbonic anhydrous enzyme. It aids in the absorption of the bicarbonate. More than telling it as absorption, till reclamation of the bicarbonate because absorption is not direct, it is indirectly absorbed through carbonic anhydrase enzyme and this indirect absorption is going to be called as reclamation, bicarbonate reclamation and not reabsorption. So, so number one, the most important function of the proximal converted tubule is bicarbonate reclamation. And number two function of the PCT is going to be the reabsorption of various solutes. In fact, you know, a um, lot of the solutes are maximally absorbed in the PCT, usually by coupling with the sodium. For instance, say the sodium glucose co-transporter, which is absorbing the glucose. So, you know, like a lot of solutes and nutrients like glucose, like, you know, a lot of uh, other nutrients like amino acids, potassium, sodium, calcium, phosphorus. These are the most important ingredients that are maximally absorbed. In fact, almost all of the 
uh, solutes or nutrients that is coming down the GFR from LR filtrate is going to be maximally absorbed in the PCT except for one nutrient, one solute that is magnesium is not maximally absorbed in the PCT. Instead, it is maximally absorbed in the thick acidic limb of the loop of Henle and the DCT or the distal converted tubule. So these are essentially the functions of the proximal converted tubule of the proximal part of the nephron. And last but not the least, there are two other functions which you should never forget about the functions of the PCT. One is the ammonia genesis. And this is very important. You will understand it later on. And uh, the next important thing is the formation of the active vitamin D because these cells do contain an enzyme called as 1-alpha hydroxylase that is helpful in formation of the active vitamin D or that is called as calcitriol. And hence, these are the most important functions. There are a lot of other functions as well, but these are the most important functions of the proximal converter tubule or the PCT. And now moving on to the distal part of the nephron. The distal part of the nephron includes something called, you know, like uh, the distal part of the distal converted tubule or the DCT and also the collecting ducts. These are collectively called as the distal part of the nephron. And what are the functions of the distal part of the nephron? The most important function of the distal part of the nephron is, first of all, the number one point you should never forget about the acid base handling because this distal part of the men, uh, like nephron is the most important site for acid base handling in the kidney by virtue of its special property called as potassium secretion sorry 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 hydrogen ion secretion or H plus secretion very 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 important hydrogen ion secretion it's happening in the distal part of the nephron and this is the most important site for acid base balance and number two the most important function is the potassium handling and yes you have to know this because a lot of people think it's only potassium secretion that is happening over here it's absolutely wrong no it is not it's actually potassium reabsorption as well as secretion are both happening in the distal part of the nephron for example during normal homeostasis almost entire, almost 100% of the potassium is reabsorbed. Like you know, maximum amount of potassium is reabsorbed from the PCT and the remaining potassium is reabsorbed in the distal part of the nephron. But in condition, only a little amount or a small amount is secreted under normal homeostatic conditions. But when you have some hyperkalemic states, this can reverse and a lot of potassium can be secreted than it is reabsorbed. So what I'm going to what I'm trying to tell you is under normal homeostasis, a lot of potassium is reabsorbed and not secreted. So when there is hyperkalemic states and this can reverse and a lot of potassium can be secreted into the urine by the distal part of the nephron. And this potassium secretion, like you know, it does not happen in any of the places except for the thick ascending limb of the loop of the Henle where it is secreted as a part of the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter channels, a family of channels. So here, the potassium under normal homeostasis, that's what you have to know, like almost all of the potassium is reabsorbed and only a small amount of potassium is secreted. But in hyperkalemic states, this can be reversed and a lot of potassium can be secreted. And number three is the two important hormones that act. One is the ADH and the aldosterone. This distal part of the nephron is the sites of action of these two important hormones, which is called the uh, antidiuretic hormone ADH and the uh, aldosterone. And having known these basic things, and you know, like having known all this basic sort of stuff, and uh, let us move on to how to differentiate between the proximal and the distal RTS. First of all, my discussion will be like differentiating the proximal and the distal RTS, then completing with the type 4 or hyperkalemic RTA. First of all, the differences, yes, I'm going to talk about the type 1 or the distal RTS and how to differentiate with type 2 or proximal RTA. So first of all, let's move on to the in a pathophysiology, what is the pathophysiology behind uh, 
the type 1 and the type 2 RTAs. So as I all told you, the distal part of the nephron is the most important site for hydrogen ion secretion again and again, the most important site for the acid-base handling and the hydrogen ion secretion. And if you tell it's the dysfunction of the distal part of the nephron in distal RTA, this hydrogen ion secretion is going to be lost. And yes, you are going to get uh, something called loss of secretion of H plus ions, which truly means you are going to accumulate a lot of, a lot of H plus ions in the body that is leading to the acidosis. Since it is due to the dysfunction of the renal tubules, it's called as renal tubular acidosis. And the basic pathophysiology behind the type 2 or the proximal RTA is nothing but excessive loss of bicarbonate in the urine. As you all know that the proximal tubule is the one that is reclaiming almost all of the bicarbonate, like most of the bicarbonate in the urine, um, that is coming from the glomerular filtrate. And so excessive loss of the bicarbonate will result again pure loss of bicarbonate that is going to give rise to metabolic acidosis. And since again this acidosis is due to renal tubular dysfunction, this is called as renal tubular acidosis. So now the common feature between these two acidosis is as I discussed in the last ABG video, is going to be metabolic acidosis. Everyone knows that, but what kind of metabolic acidosis is normal and uncapped metabolic acidosis? This is very important. Why? Because if you don't have any idea about what is normal and uncapped metabolic acidosis, please refer to my last ABG video where I told you either the pure gain of H plus ions or pure, sorry, pure gain of H plus ions or pure loss of bicarbonate from the body will result in a normal and uncapped metabolic acidosis. This is the pathophysiology behind why there is a normal and uncapped metabolic acidosis in renal tubular acidosis. So now this is the pathophysiology. Having said, what is the pathophysiology? Next, moving on to the second feature. The second feature is common is a common feature for both again, and this is hypokalemia. And you all know why there is going to be hypokalemia in a proximal and distal RTA. So, for example, if you take a proximal RTA, as I told previously, like almost maximum potassium is absorbed in the proximal tubule PCT proximal commuter tubule of the nephron. And hence, since there you lose a lot of potassium ions in proximal tubular dysfunction, there will be hypokalemia very easily. And uh, in distal RTA, again, I told you the potassium handling in the normal homeostasis, almost entire of the potassium should be reabsorbed. And uh, in distal RTS, again, this reabsorption of the potassium is lost. And hence, since the reabsorption of the potassium is lost, you will lose a lot of potassium in the urine, and that might result. Uh, in uh, hypokalemia and uh, another reason why you tend to get uh, you know hypokalemia is uh, like potassium washout that's what uh, we used to tell the potassium washout that is happening in the renal tubular acidosis now coming on to the other features of the renal tubular acidosis so now I told you the Pathophysiology and the difference and these are the two common features the normal handicap metabolic acidosis and the hypokalemia are the common features between the type 1 and the type 2 RTAs. Now what are the differences now moving on to the important differences between the type 1 and the type 2 RTAs. The most important difference is going to be the severity of the acidosis. How will be the severity? Since I told you the distal part of the nephron is the most important site in acid base handling the acidosis tends to be very severe in case of this latte because we produce a lot of organic acids all these organic acids are uh, you know have to get rid as a waste into the urine and this getting rid of the organic acids is done by the distal distal tubule distal part of the nephron by secretion of H plus ions into the urine and this secretion of the H plus ions into the urine is lost totally in case of dysfunction of the distal part of the nephron so hence the severity will be like very severe acidosis in case of uh, distal RTA and the, usually the acidosis in proximal RTA tends to be mild. The severity tends to be mild. Why? Because of two reasons. Number one, 
the acid base handling is entirely present in the distal part of the nephron and number two reason i didn't tell you there and uh, this distal part of the nephron is also capable of forming new bicarbonate new bicarbonate formation so when you have like you know the dis dysfunction of the distal part of the nephron this new bicarbonate formation is also lost along with the H plus secretion so the acidosis tends to be extremely severe but whereas in due to dysfunctions of the PCT or the proximal convective tubule this excessively lost bicarbonate can be contracted by the formation of the new bicarbonate in the distal part of the nephron and hence the acidosis tends to be a little bit mild in case of proximal renal tubular acidosis. So this severity is clearly evident in the serum bicarbonate levels where in distal RTH the serum bicarbonate levels usually tend to be less than 15 milli milli coolants per liter or millimoles per liter and the serum bicarbonate levels in proximal renal tubular acidosis tends to be more than 15. And what are the other differences? For example, if you take in the proximal RTA, these patients do not lose only the bicarbonate. These patients, the proximal tubule is also absorbing a whole lot of nutrients and solutes into them so from the glomerular filtrate. And so you have to lose a lot of other substances in the urine along with the bicarbonate. These substances include you lose a lot of potassium. Yes, that's why you are ending up in hypokalemia in proximal RTA and these patients also tend to lose a lot of glucose in the urine. Yes, this is going to produce something called glycosuria. And these patients also tend to lose a lot of amino acids in the urine. Yes, and these patients also tend to have something called amino acid urea. And these patients also tend to lose a lot of calcium and a lot of phosphate in the urine as well. So you have a very, very low levels of serum calcium and serum phosphate and this also can be attributed because I told you the proximal tubule is also synthesizing an important hormone called 1-alpha hydroxylase which is involved in the conversion of inactive vitamin D to calcitriol which is the active vitamin D 125-hydroxycholic calciprolan. Since these patients tend to have decreased vitamin D levels and this can also be a reason for why the serum calcium and phosphate are very low in these patients and you know like if you, even if you have very low, uh, this, because these patients tend to have very low serum calcium and serum phosphate and, and vitamin D as well, these patients are more prone for bone problems as well. So they have a whole lot of bone problems with them compared to the distal RTA patients. And none of these features are like, these patients lose a lot of potassium and only because of the like loss of potassium handling in the distal tubule, they tend to have hypokalemia but they doesn't have any of these features. None of these features are present. They do not have diclosuria, they do not have amino acid urea, and they do not have less serum calcium or less serum phosphate. In fact, these patients sometimes can have normal or increased serum calcium because this is not the scope of the video right now because a lot of hypercalcemic conditions itself are the causes of distal renal tubular acidosis. Hence, you know, these patients usually tend to have high serum calcium or sometimes normal serum calcium, but usually they don't tend to have a decreased serum calcium and a phosphate. They have a normal or increased serum calcium with a normal serum phosphate. And another most important point, and these patients, these distal RTA patients, tend to have something called uh, hypocitraturia, you know. Like uh, this hypocitraturia is the most important factor for the formation of renal stones in these patients. And there are a lot of theories for hypocitraturia because of the acidosis, the proximal tubules utilize a lot of citrate in the Krebs cycle and okay that all these stuff are there but still uh, there is no standard conclusion of why these patients are having hypocitraturia but hypocitraturia is a well known risk factor for the calcium phosphate stone formation. Why? Because these patients you know like uh, this citrate usually combines with complexes with calcium and when they complex together the amount of free calcium in the urine decreases leaving very little free calcium and uh, for uh, and if you don't have adequate citrate in the urine in conditions like hypocitraturia this citrate cannot complex with the calcium and the amount of the free calcium now is going to increase 
So this increased amount of free calcium you call it as hypocalci hypercalciuria and this hypercalciuria is going to form some stones called calcium phosphate stones and this is the reason for why these distal artery patients is going to have nephrolithiasis and nephrolithiasis is one of the most important important differentiating features between the distal and the proximal artery. The distal artery patients usually tend to have nephrolithiasis whereas the proximal artery patients do not have something called nephrolithiasis and you know the citrate the protective effect of uh, citrate in the prevention of renal stones is you know like a lot of patients in the clinics you would have seen your consultants are giving something called uh, potassium citrate now this citrate is usually used in clinics to prevent uh, recurrent stone formation in a patient with repeated stones in the urinary tract so that's why that's the rationale of giving apart from alkalinizing the urine this rate can decrease the calcium excretion in the urine and this hypocitraturia is one of the most important risk factors for nephrolithiasis in these distal artery patients and apart from that it, you know, it will be a huge sin if I don't tell the urinary pH in these patients you know the urinary pH depends on the amount of H plus ions in the urine, free H plus ions in the urine. So it actually directly, this urine pH is directly dependent on the distal nephron, distal part of the nephron. This, yes, obviously this urine pH is directly dependent on the distal part of the nephron. So if you have problems with the distal part of the nephron, where there is difficulty in the secretion of the H plus ions, the urine pH tends to be alkaline, it can never be acidic. Usually in the presence of acidosis, this is a normal physiology, in the presence of acidosis, if the tubules are functioning normally, they have to secrete more H plus ions into the urine and the urine should also be, they have to secrete more H plus ions in the urine and the urine should also be acidic. This is under normal physiological conditions if the tubules are also functioning normally. In the presence of acidosis, the urine should be acidic if the tubules are functioning normally. But whereas in distal RTA, this secretion of H plus ions, despite the presence of acidosis in RTA, cannot happen and hence the urine pH will be, will definitely be alkaline. Which means the urine pH will be more than 5.5 for sure. And But whereas in proximal renal tubular acidosis, the urine pH can be alkaline or it can be acidic. In some patients there are a lot of reasons the reason for alkaline pH is nothing but when you have more bicarbonate excretion in the urine when you have bicarbonate urea more bicarbonate this can complex with the H plus and then can decrease the free H plus in the urine and can produce an alkaline urine or it can produce an acidic urine since the distal nephron is distal part of the nephron is intact and they can secrete H plus ions into the urine and hence they can also produce acidic urine. So this usually if you find metabolic acidosis with alkaline urine, please suspect a renal tubular acidosis because there is a lot there is a problem in the tubular function over there. And here the urinary pH can be either more than 5.5 or less than 5.5 as I discussed. But usually at one of the traditional tests is there which is usually going to differentiate between you know the two types of the renal tubular acidosis in the presence of alkaline urine thus test is nothing but the ammonium chloride test so what is basically ammonium chloride test this ammonium chloride when you give intravenously this ammonium chloride is going to release ammonium plus hydrogen ions and this free hydrogen ions is going to make the body acidic and this excess H plus ions has to be gotten Get, uh, has to be gotten rid out of the body and this is usually done by the distal nephron so after giving you know like um, ammonium chloride if the distal nephron is intact that will secrete H plus ions and it will make the urine pH acidic and if the distal nephron is not intact H plus ions these excessive H plus ions cannot be secreted and hence urine can never be acidic and it can only be alkaline. This is true in case of distal RTA where 
despite after giving ammonium chloride the H plus ions cannot be secreted into the urine and the urine remains alkaline and the pH remains more than 5.5 and uh, whereas in proximal RTA even though sometimes the urine pH can be alkaline after giving the ammonium chloride intravenously this excessive H plus can be secreted via the distal nephron since it is intact and it can make the urine pH acidic. This is the basis behind the ammonium chloride test. So after the ammonium chloride test, if you find an acidic urine, you suspect a proximal RTA or if you have an alkaline urine, you suspect a distal renal tubular acidosis. And apart from that, among the treatment part, so you know like uh, the bicarbonate levels in uh, Distal renal tubular acidosis tends to be less than 15 and it's a very severe metabolic acidosis and you need large bicarbonate replacements, large bicarbonate lethal replacements per day and this bicarbonate replacement traditionally is said to be more than 5 millimoles per kilogram per day whereas in proximal renal tubular acidosis you have very little uh, acidosis, mild acidosis and uh, these patients also tend to have uh, little bicarbonate replacements for example classically less than 5 millimoles per kilograms per day like most of the textbooks give a value of 1 to 3 millimoles per kilogram per day this is the amount of bicarbonate that you have to be that you have to replace in case of a proximal renal tubular acidosis and uh, oh yeah yeah i forgot to tell one more thing uh, where okay let me tell you here it's about the urinary bicarbonate if you take the urinary bicarbonate the bicarbonate losses are heavy in case of uh, proximal RTA where there is bicarbonate washout so the urinary bicarbonate will be more than 15 in case of uh, proximal RTA whereas here the predominant problem is not the bicarbonate washout whereas the loss of secretion of H plus ion so the urinary bicarbonate tends to be less than 10 in case of the distal RTA and this is the one of the most important differences between the proximal and the distal renal tubular acidosis. And the most important next thing is knowing about the causes of the renal tubular acidosis. I'm going to tell a uh, few of the causes of the renal tubular acidosis with uh, type 1 and type 2 renal tubular acidosis. Let me tell you first, uh, let me erase this and go back to the top. A little bit erase and go back to the top. Yes. And what are the causes of uh, distal renal tubular acidosis? And proximal renal tubular acidosis and there is you know like it's an extremely easy condition to know the cause of type 1 and type 2 renal tubular acidosis I will tell you in a very easiest way so in distal renal tubular acidosis most of the hypercalciuric states or hypercalcemic usually all the almost all of the hypercalcemic patients will have hypercalciuria with the expect, exception of being benign hypocalciuric hypercalcemia but still a lot of hypercalcemic patients will have hypercalciuria and hence this hypercalcemia, this calcium is directly toxic to the distal nephron and they can cause distal renal tubular acidosis. For example, you take uh, sarcoidosis and you can take vitamin D toxicity and uh, you can take uh, another example like multiple myeloma. All these things, you know, can cause a lot of conditions like hyperparathyroidism parathyroidism all those things producing hypercalcemia can cause distal renal tubular acidosis and certain of the drugs can cause distal renal tubular acidosis and you have to should not forget you know like i used to remember by the mnemonic called lac and this lacoperon we have know that there's the mnemonic for this drugs causing distal renal tubular acidosis and that is lithium amphotericin b by inducing pores into the distal tubules and uh, distal nephron and also cisplatin all these things can cause distal renal tubular acidosis all these drugs can cause distal tubular acidosis and uh, apart from this one syndrome you should never forget and that syndrome is called Jogan syndrome Jogan syndrome and distal RTA association has been like long associated and I myself in my personal experience have a lot of cases of Jogan syndrome presenting with distal renal tubular acidosis and so do not forget Jogan syndrome which is a very common entrance examination question apart from that lot of like uh, this uh, like sickle cell anemia like nephrocalcinosis features vesicular reflex pyronephritis and uh, medullary sponge kidney 
MSK, which is just nothing but the benign dilatation of the collecting ducts and all the middle is one kidney and all these things can cause this latte, but do not forget this causes. And type 2 of the proximal RT, what are the causes of uh, proximal RT? The proximal RT, I told you all the standard causes usually cause this latte and all those the fancy causes are going to cause the proximal RT. And whenever I tell the word fancy, you should uh, get Fanconi syndrome in mind. So, you know, a lot of, there are Fanconi syndrome is a syndrome and a lot of things can cause Fanconi syndrome and uh, like for example the genetic causes like cystinosis or Wilson's disease like Lowy syndrome and familial fructose intolerance or hereditary we call FFI or hereditary fructose intolerance or HFI all those things are going to cause Fanconi syndrome these are genetic causes of Fanconi syndrome and a lot of tubular interstitial diseases can also cause a lot of tubular interstitial diseases can also cause Fanconi syndrome for example like you know like immune rejections can cause Fanconi's and medullary cystic disease can destroy the tubules especially the proximal tubules and cause Fanconi's medullary cystic disease or MCD or sometimes even multiple myeloma can cause Fanconi's why multiple myeloma multiple myeloma can cause distal RT by producing hypercalcemia and uh, proximal RT by the deposition of immunoglobulins or light chain immunoglobulins in the tubules thereby destroying the proximal tubules producing proximal and apart from these causes a lot of drugs uh, can actually cause proximal RT and there are certain drugs you should never forget um, that cause proximal RT and as Azolomid everyone knows that it's a carbonic anilase in uh, bit her sorry for the spelling and estazolamide which is a carbonic antacid inhibitor can cause proximal RTA like picture and a lot of other drugs like genophobia like uh, nowadays we are recently seeing a lot of genophobia induced Fanconi like syndromes and so don't forget the genophobia causing Fanconi syndrome and this is a newer relatively newer drug in the HRT as well as hepatitis B treatment and this is one of the latest points and do not forget this drug and other drugs like something like iphosphamide again sorry for the spelling iphosphamide and also some drugs like you know gentamicin can cause the proximal RTA like picture and these are essentially the causes of proximal and the distal RTAs and do not forget these causes for sure and uh, type 1 distal RTA again has a recap the hypercalcemia and certain drugs and Jordan syndrome and middle age sponge kidney and type 2 are the proximal RTAs especially the Fanconi syndromes. These are all comes under the Fanconi syndromes, everything except the Astrozolomid, everything comes under Fanconi syndromes. Fanconi syndrome is like a group of disorders which destroys or which causes destruction of the proximal part of the nephron, proximal converted tubule is called Fanconi syndrome. And uh, exception of all these which does not cause Fanconi syndrome is Astrozolomid. Astrozolomid do not cause Fanconi syndrome because it purely inhibits only the carbonic antacid enzyme and causes no destruction of the PCT. Apart from this, all of the other causes which I have mentioned causes destruction of the proximal tubules and results in Fanconi syndrome. So now, having finished the type 1 and the type 2 renal tubular acidosis, now we are going to discuss something about called the type 4 renal tubular acidosis. And what is type 4 renal tubular acidosis? It's called as hyperkalemic RTA. So what is the reason for hyperkalemia in these patients and there's a lot of speculated hypothesis and all those things and the most important reason for this hyperkalemic type 4 renal tubular acidosis is hypoaldosteronism. What are the things that cause hypoaldosteronism or aldosterone resistance is going to produce type 4 renal tubular acidosis. The most important two causes which I used to tell to the students is nothing but the diabetic nephropathy and the AC inhibitors, both these things are the two most important reasons for type 4 renal tubular acidosis. And uh, uh, how this diabetic nephropathy is going to cause hypoaldosteronism and how hypoaldosteronism is going to cause this renal tubular acidosis. For that, first of all, you have to understand the physiology and what is the physiology behind this type 4 RTA. For example, hypoaldosteronism, as I told you. This hypo aldo, uh, the functions of the aldosterone is increased sodium reabsorption, 
followed by increased potassium excretion thereby causing hypokalemia and also it causes increased hydrogen ion excretion producing metabolic alkalosis so these are the effects of aldosterone and in hyperaldosteronism you get the reverse of all these three the most conspicuous being hyperkalemia so that is the most important thing this hyperkalemia is the most important uh, feature of a type 4 RTS so this hyperaldosteronism is the most important reason for this type 4 renal tubular acidosis and it causes hyperkalemia as well as metabolic acidosis due to retention of the H plus ions. This in a crude way there are a lot of other ammonia genesis related hypothesis as well so which can result in metabolic acidosis but that's beyond the scope of the video and hence remember that this type 4 hyperkalemic metabolic acidosis or type 4, type 4 renal tubular acidosis is due to hypoaldosteronism or aldosterone resistance. And now the question comes how this diabetic nephropathy is going to cause hyperaldosteronism the answer being very simple again draw a nephron I can draw a nephron and uh, these are the afferent okay let me do it afferent and the uh, afferent vessel this is the afferent arteriole and this is the afferent arteriole for that matters and in diabetes mellitus there will be something called the basement membrane thickening when you have this increased basement membrane thickenings your filtration pressure tends to increase and there is a huge filtrate that contains more sodium and this more sodium is delivered to the DCT and this increased sodium in the filtrate is sensed by one of the important structures called macula densa that is present in the distal convoluted tubule and this macula densa is going to give signal to an important structure called chest glomerular apparatus and this chest glomerular apparatus is going to produce less renin and this less renin is going to cause less aldosterone and this less aldosterone is going to cause and all those hyperkalemia and other stuff so let us leave all those and this is the like physiology pathophysiology behind how diabetic nephropathy causes low aldosterone or hypoaldosteronic state and uh, how AC inhibitors? AC inhibitors is a straightforward thing. So if you take an AC inhibitor, it is going to decrease the production of angiotensin 2 because AC is the enzyme that is present in the pulmonary capillaries that is going to like convert angiotensin 1 into active angiotensin 2. And when you block the AC, there will be less angiotensin 2 and there will be less aldosterone. So this is how the AC inhibitors cause hyperaldosterone. So not only these, these are the most common conditions, but any other condition that causes hyperaldosteronism can cause like type 4 renal tubular acidosis and do not worry about that the type 4 renal tubular acidosis so these two are the most important and the commonest causes so before signing off like the last thing is going to be the common features between the type 1 and type 2 RTS so what are the common features between the type 1 and type 2 RTS so you can see both these Patients uh, will have a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis and both these patients, you know, might have uh, hypokalemia and both these patients uh, might have, you know, normal serum creatinine and normal blood pressure. This is very important and both these patients will have, may have, not all, all almost all the same, may have an increased urine pH or alkaline urine both these patients and which you can differentiate at times through uh, harmonium chloride test and yes these are the common features between the type 1 and the type 2 RTS and already I discussed about uh, the differentiating, differentiating features between the type 1 and type 2 RTS and yes and hope you all enjoy the video and uh, thank you very much for more interesting stats and more interesting concepts and uh, related stuff on nephrology and all the other subjects for that matters. Please do mail me for the questions and my mail ID is going to be Dilip Spartan 89 at yahoo.com 
and if you want more interesting stuff to be learned and more interesting medicine which is to be learned and on a funny note please do attend my classes and cheers thanks for watching the video and meet you next time bye bye